Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and we are in the midst of one of our busy seasons. Yesterday, we had the semi-annual Global Economic Perspectives with David Stockton, Karen Dynan, our great new senior fellow, and Joe Gagnon. And today, we are moving on to a discussion of some non-trivial, influential outside work, um, but on topics closely near and dear to the heart of many here at the Institute, the relationship between fiscal efficiency, particularly tax efficiency, and productivity. Um, as came up in our ample discussions of the border adjustment tax in the U.S. in recent weeks, including here at the Institute, there is there are a lot of claims made back and forth about the importance of tax reform to long-term growth and to long-term productivity. Um, the availability of good cross-sectional work that is reliable and not ideological on this topic is quite limited. And therefore, it is as no surprise and very welcome that the fiscal department, fiscal affairs department of the IMF has chosen to make this a focus of their latest fiscal monitor, um, and we're delighted to have Vitor Gaspar and Laura Jaramillo, thank you, um, Laura Jaramillo of the Fiscal Department here with us today to present the work of them and their colleagues. Uh, just a, a brief note that, um, that we have had a series, it is ad hoc but recurring, uh, with department heads and distinguished authors behind them uh, from the IMF coming in to present some of their newest work. We, in addition to Vitor, uh, we've had Chang Yong Ri from the Asia Department, David Lipton, the Deputy MD, um, La Alejandro Werner from the Latin American Department, and so on. Um, and we view this as a valuable relationship in the sense that the IMF gets out of its building and out of a high-class hotel in some godforsaken place, um, and instead comes here and confronts the intellectual liveliness of the Peterson Institute crowd and, and uh, our fellows. At the same time, we get to encourage the fund to put forward some of the more thematic and interesting, and I hope draw more attention to this, some of their more thematic work. Um, so this is, what we're discussing today, is part of the semi-annual, or is it triannual, I can never remember. Um, fiscal monitor, but it is, in a sense, the box or the thematic chapter. And Vitor Gaspar was kind enough to do something similar a year ago, and we're glad to have him back. We're also joined today by two distinguished discussants, so let me just quickly talk about the bios of our speakers today and then turn it over for substance. Uh, Vitor Gaspar, of course, is currently the director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. I've known him and considered him a friend for a very long time, back to when he was Director General of Research at the, at the ECB. Um, he, of course, uh, has gone on to many other positions since then, including as Minister of State and Finance for Portugal during the cleanup from the crisis in 2011 to 2013. Is a true European, working at the European Commission's Bureau of European Policy Advisors during 2007 to 2010, and of course now has been at the fund since, I believe, 2013. Um, he also, of course, has a distinguished academic record, which we tend to take for granted in this business, but is still worth noting. Uh, he is joined for today's presentation by Laura Jaramillo Mayor, who is the Deputy Division Chief in the Fiscal Affairs Department. Um, her reputation precedes her. She's been doing great work since joining the fund in 2002. And she also worked at the Ministry of Finance of Colombia uh, as assistant to the vice minister prior to joining the fund, has uh, graduate studies from Princeton and was clearly one of the lead authors on this set of research. And so we're delighted to have her here to present the research in her own voice in this vein. Uh, we, as usual, one of the great things I'm proud of at PIE is what we call convening power, both internal and external. And so given the topic and the authors, it was easier than usual. But we're delighted to have Jason Furman, who has been with us as a senior fellow since uh, somehow running out of employment sometime in January. Um, Jason, of course, was chairman of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors until then, after serving of a variety of 
of senior economic posts in both the Obama and Clinton administrations, working across the street at Brookings on tax issues in between administrations and teaching, another person whose distinguished academic contributions should not be taken for granted. And in particular, he of course is an expert on tax issues. And we look forward to him thinking from his practical perspective as well as the US perspective about the lessons that Vitor and Laura are giving us. And then finally, our discussant, uh, our external discussant as it were, I'm delighted to have Mihir Desai, who is a professor jointly at the Harvard Business School and the Harvard Law School. Um, as a Harvard graduate, I'm aware of what a big deal that is. Um, Mihir, of course, is not only Mizuho Financial Group Professor of Finance at the Business School, he is at the MBR, he has run the MBR's India program, he has worked in the real world at CS First Boston and at McKinsey, and of course this understates his influence and of his writing. He remains one of the world's leading experts on matters of corporate taxation, international tax, tax competition, um, advises a number of both research efforts and companies, and has had an effect on tax policy in countries ranging from India to the United States and many in between. So we're grateful that Mihir took the time to come down from Cambridge to join us today. Thank you very much. It's a very packed program. I now shut up and I turn it over to Vitor Gaspar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam, uh, for your uh, kind words of introduction. Uh, many thanks uh, to the Peterson Institute for hosting us uh, in this uh, presentation of uh, the analytical chapter of the uh, fiscal monitor. We're uh, looking at uh, tax and uh, productivity. Uh, we had a similar topic uh, a year ago where we look at uh, how uh, public policies could uh, influence uh, innovation and productivity growth. So there is a continuity uh, between these uh, two uh, seminars at the uh, Peterson. Let's see if this uh, works. Ah. Now normally pressing the button is something which is within uh, what I can do, but I was uh, being challenged. So th the way we are going to do this is I will cover the first two parts of the outline, the uh, motivation, and uh, I will present some uh, estimates of the gains from uh, resource misallocation. And then Laura will cover the use of tax instruments to affect uh, resource misallocation, and uh, she will conclude. <clears throat> so all this uh, uh, discussion about uh, productivity uh, and <clears throat> policy instruments, so productivity and uh, policy, is related to the fact that around the world there is the perception that the behavior of productivity has been disappointing. We would like to have uh, productivity evolving uh, stronger because uh, productivity is the most important uh, factor driving uh, living standards uh, in the uh, long run. I will not elaborate on the trends that we have uh, on this slide for uh, advanced economies, emerging markets, and low-income developing countries because I believe that these trends are familiar to all of you. In all these country groups, in all countries, we would like productivity growth to be uh, stronger. Now, to repeat the point that I've already made concerning our presentation uh, one year ago, one can uh, affect productivity in a number of different ways. One year ago, we were looking at how one can push outward the uh, technological frontier. So it was about uh, innovation, it was about research and development, it was about uh, externalities associated with uh, knowledge, all uh, very important topics. This time we look at a much more precise 
uh, question, we look at misallocation of uh, resources within very narrowly defined uh, industries, and uh, we want to quantify this misallocation, and then we want to go about thinking about how can tax policy reform, revenue administration reform affect misallocation. <clears throat> okay, I, I think it's worthwhile to think for a little while, spend a little time thinking about what is this notion of a resource misallocation and where does resource misallocation across firms within a narrowly defined industry come from. And in this chart, we consider a very simple uh, uh, illustration in which we have two firms, uh, firm A and firm B. We consider only uh, one factor of production, uh, labor, and we think about the allocation of labor among, between these two firms, okay? So uh, the allocation that maximizes uh, efficiency across these two firms is one that equalizes the marginal product of labor in the two firms. And that's what you would expect to see in competitive equilibrium uh, in an economy, okay? So nothing uh, at all fancy here. Now, it turns out that you may have a number of distortions in the world. You could think of many. In this particular case, we just consider that there is a labor tax. There is some tax that affects the gross uh, wage rate. And we can imagine a uh, negative tax on uh, firm A and a uh, positive uh, tax on firm uh, B. And what's going to happen is that this distortion, the fact that the two firms are not being treated the same, leads to a situation where uh, firm A, in this case the least uh, efficient firm, is going to expand and firm B, the most efficient firm, is going to contract relative to the uh, uh, equilibrium. Now, it turns out that this is costly. The uh, output, the value of the output in this sector is the sum of the area below these lines in the chart. And so you can see the loss associated with misallocation as this uh, triangle. Uh, and uh, that was the focus of uh, this research. In uh, practice, of course, we have uh, more factors than labor, and we have more distor distortions than tax, so this is more complicated than what I've just explained, but this is the uh, general idea. Now, empirically, what you get is something like what you have uh, on this slide. And this slide is definitely worth looking at uh, with some attention. I'm a great fan of this slide. I didn't make it, so I can't be a fan of it. So on the left-hand side, you have two countries, one uh, more efficient in blue and another less efficient uh, in uh, red. And you do see that the different levels of efficiency affect the whole distribution. On the right-hand side, you have a normalization that it's, it's the same distribution, but you normalize by taking the mean and then taking the log. And what you see on the right-hand side more clearly than on the left-hand side is that the difference between the more efficient country and the less efficient country comes from the fact that in the less efficient country, you have many more firms that are less efficient. They're firms that should be out of 
business for efficiency reasons, but they're not. For whatever reason, perhaps because implicitly they're being subsidized, they don't go out of business. Now, how important are these uh, types of uh, effects? They're huge. We're talking about very, very large effects. These effects are level effects. They're not growth effects. But we estimate the level effect, and then we convert it, and that's what is shown in this uh, picture, into uh, uh, growth effects over a period of 20 years. We present it that way because we thought it would be uh, more uh, intuitive. And so if you go across the three country groups, advanced economies, emerging uh, market economies, and low-income de developing uh, countries, you have this enormous effect on average of about one percentage point for growth lasting for 20 years. It's a very, very large effect associated with misallocation at the uh, industry uh, level. The effect is actually larger, as you can see, for uh, emerging markets and for uh, low-income countries than for uh, advanced uh, economies. And then the question is, OK, so we have this uh, very large effect. How much can we get from you, the use of tax policy instruments, revenue administration instruments? And there in the uh, chapter, we'll look at a number of uh, distortions capit across capital asset types, across sources of financing, between formal and informal firms, between small and large firms. And what we find is that for emerging markets and low-income developing uh, countries, measures of tax reform, measures pertaining to revenue administration, can allow one-fourth of this effect to be reaped. It's still a very large effect. So tax policy and revenue administration matter a lot. And for you to know where these results are coming from, you will have to listen to Laura. Well, thank you, Vitor. So as Vitor said, I will be looking at what is the contribution of tax policies and tax administration to resource misallocation. And as Vitor was saying earlier, there are many um, important sources of misallocation. They arise because of ill-designed government policies or from poorly functioning markets that affect certain firms over others. There are a number of examples, tax incentives that are based on size or on location, weak tax administrations and, for, and enforcement, product market regulations that limit market access, um, preferential loans to specific firms, financial markets that are not well developed, and I could name many others. But here in our fiscal monitor, we make the case that tax policy and tax administration are important factors that policymakers need to take into account when they're thinking about the productivity challenge. Vitor already mentioned the four tax distortions that we looked at. We are only looking at a selection of policies. We did not, this is not an exhaustive list. But what we wanted to do with, this, uh, with these four examples is to give concrete examples of how the design of tax systems can affect, can result in differentiated tax treatment across firms. And I will, in, in the next slides, I will go into each one of these in turn. So let me start with the first one. We explore disparities in tax and effective marginal tax rates across capital asset types. The effective marginal tax rate is an indicator of the various ta factors affecting investors' decisions when they are deciding on whether to move ahead with a new investment. Disparities in the effective marginal tax rate across capital asset types 
can result in resource misallocation when they steer investors towards lower return investments because they are tax favored. To illustrate, this slide shows four developing countries that a higher tax disparity is associated with lower share of investments in the asset that is tax disadvantaged. We measure tax disparity as the effective marginal tax rate on machinery minus the effective marginal tax rate on buildings. In our sample of countries, about half of the countries have a positive tax disparity and many countries have a tax disparity close to 10, per 10 percentage points. For each industry, the blue bars in the chart show the share of machinery as, so machinery as a share of total assets for countries with a low tax disparity. The red bars show the share of machinery in total assets for countries with a large, with a high tax disparity. And as you can see, for most industries, the blue bar is longer than the red bar. And it's especially the case for the industries that are at the bottom of the chart, which are those industries that actually have a higher share of machinery overall. In our analysis, we find that eliminating this tax disparity would raise productivity in machinery intensive industries, and also that this would have a positive impact on aggregate productivity. The second tax distortion that we look at is corporate debt bias. Corporate debt bias occurs when there is a higher cost on equity financed investment compared to debt financed investment. Corporate debt bias can create resource misallocation when it affects investment decisions that are more dependent on equity. Research and development is a clear case. Innovative firms, especially startups, tend to rely on equity to finance their R&D investment because there are no, there are no um, collateral requirements and also investors will be able to share in upside returns. This chart illustrates the positive correlation between research and development um, intensity of industries and their dependence on equity. And you can see that there's that positive relationship. So by imposing a higher cost on equity compared to debt, debt bias ends up imposing a higher cost on research and development compared to other capital spending. Our empirical results for advanced economies indicate that by removing or reducing corporate debt bias, you will have a positive effect on industries that are more intensive in R&D. And the effect on the aggregate economy is likely to go beyond our, our estimates because R&D will also uh, ex expand the technology frontier for the country. Let me turn to the third tax distortion that we study. We find that differentiated tax treatment across formal and informal firms is a problem not only for revenue collection, but also for productivity. Our analysis focuses narrowly on cheats. What, are, what do, are we referring to when we say cheats? These are firms that are registered with the tax authority, but that underreport their sales for tax purposes. Through tax evasion, cheats enjoy a potentially large implicit subsidies that allows them to stay in business despite having lower productivity. Because of this implicit subsidy, cheats have a higher or larger share of, of the market than they should at the expense of the more productive tax compliant firms. This chart for emerging markets and low income developing countries shows that there is indeed a productivity difference between tax compliant firms, which are in blue, and sheets, which are the bars in red. Our empirical results show that stronger tax administration reduces the prevalence of cheats in the economy. This raises, is found to raise productivity because it makes room for productive tax compliant firms to have a higher share, market share in the economy. As these com tax compliant firms grow, they absorb a larger amount of labor and capital, and they will have a higher weight in the economy, increasing aggregate productivity. Now I turn to the last tax distortion that we look at. Preferential tax treatment for small firms can result in resource misallocation if more productive firms decide to stay small in order to remain below the eligibility threshold. This creates a, a small business trap. The small business trap affects aggregate productivity because, larger, because a larger share of the output of the economy 
is produced by smaller, less efficient firms that fail to take advantage of economies of scale and of scope. This figure illustrates that preferential tax regimes can create a disincentive for small firms to grow. It shows that older firms tend to grow less in countries that offer lower tax rates for small firms, that's the red line, compared to countries that do not have this type of incentive. Our regression analysis for advanced, emerging market, and low-income countries shows that getting rid of this preferential tax for small firms has a positive effect on productivity. So what specific tax policies can help reduce misallocation? In our fiscal monitor, we call for minimizing the tax treatments that discriminate across types of assets and across sources of financing. This can help tilt firms' investment decisions towards assets that are more productive rather than tax favored. The allowance for corporate equity system and a cash flow tax can both can address these two types of distortions. We also call for leveling the playing field across firms to encourage productive firms to grow. Lower tax compliance costs and stronger tax enforcement can help reduce the unfair cost advantage that informal firms enjoy. Lower tax compliance costs will also help encourage growth and productivity among small and young firms. So the less resources that these firms spend on filing their taxes, the more resources they can use on productive activities. Lastly, to avoid the small business trap, tax relief could be more effective if, we're, if they were targeted to new rather than to small firms. So now let me conclude. At the IMF, we see raising productivity as a major challenge. Our recent work has focused on shedding light on this issue with the aim of identifying policies that can help increase growth over the medium term. In our most recent fiscal monitor, we are able to show that there are substantial gains to be made from narrowing the productivity gap across firms. In particular, reducing the distortions that weigh on productive firms can lift annual real GDP growth by 1% per year for 20 years. We also find that developing countries can achieve a quarter of these gains by improving the design of their tax policies and tax administration. These findings complement our earlier work, as mentioned by Victor, where we looked at fiscal policies to increase R&D and innovation. We recognize that this is the start of a conversation. I'm sure that the discussion today will be very enlightening, and I look forward to a very lively discussion. Thank you. Um, so there's um, an expression, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And um, the shame is on me for discussing this paper. Um, last year, I was invited to discuss a paper that Vitor did and I agreed without reading the paper. I got the paper, and I just agreed with every word in it from beginning to end, which is just an embarrassing and terrible position to put a discussant into. Um, this year, Adam asked me if I wanted to discuss something by Vitor. I once again um, failed to read the paper. Um, once again, finally got around to reading it and was thinking it left me with, with very little in the way of, of negative, terrible things um, to say about it. So apologies in advance. Um, I spent a lot of time on business tax reform in the Obama administration, a lot of time looking at different models about the impact of tax reform. And what was really frustrating was that those models, for the most part, didn't capture what I thought was most important in reform and most of what I thought we could accomplish in reform. And you look, um, one of the important contributions of this paper is to remedy that problem. So you look at a typical dynamic scoring or dynamic analysis model of a tax plan, and it has capital, you know, just capital K, one sector. And you look at how the tax plan changes the cost of capital. And if it does, you get more capital. And if you have more capital, you get more productivity. Some of the fancier models might have a few different types of capital and a few different sectors. And you could get some shift in the allocation of capital between sectors. 
But all of this misses a lot of what you're really trying to do in business tax reform, which is first of all not about capital, but about total factor productivity. And second of all, about the allocation of capital across sectors, but also within sectors across different types of firms, which are um, enormously heterogeneous, something that has implications not just for productivity, but for inequality, as I've talked about elsewhere. So one of the important contributions of this paper is to shift the debate from the impact on capital to the impact on TFP, and including looking at the allocation um, within sectors. This has important implications for public policy as well, because it says that when you think about tax reform, it's not just what you get the rate to that matters, which is a single-minded focus on the accumulation of capital, but instead that you could have really large potential benefits from revenue neutral tax reform, and that you want to get them by making a tax system that's neutral, that doesn't distort economic decisions, so that when you're a business, you're doing something because it has the highest rate of return to the economy before taxes, not because that decision has changed because rates of return vary after taxes. And one shorthand way of putting that is the tax reform becomes about the quality of capital, not about the quantity of capital. In terms of the neutralities that one wants to try to achieve, in some sense then it becomes less, you, know, you can pick whatever rate you want, 80%, 10%. What you want to do is look at the rates on different activities and see how they vary. And one thing we used to do, for example, when we looked at um, tax reform proposals, was we would look at about 10 different sectors and calculate the standard deviation of tax rates across those 10 sectors. And we'd always look at that metric when we looked at different tax reforms. And the goal was to make that number as low as possible. In fact, ideally, that number should be zero. So you don't get overinvestment in equipment or in structures just because of the tax code. Um, we, the paper discusses um, the debt equity distortions in the tax code. I think it only talks about one of the th three issues that that presents. The issue that the paper discusses is if you want to finance something risky and high return like R&D, you can finance that through more easily through equity that allows someone to share the upside than through debt where um, they can walk away in the downside scenario. And so that's one of the channels. Um, the second channel is that overly leveraged firms are more fragile, more prone to bankruptcy. There can be enormous destruction of value in bankruptcy, fire sales, and um, firms can be tempted to gamble for resurrection in those types of circumstances. Um, and then the third issue with overleveraging is just the macroeconomic consequences of greater financial fragility and what that does to the economy as a whole. A third um, issue which is discussed in this paper is wanting to have the same tax rate on businesses regardless of whether they're pass-throughs or C-corps, which is a big issue here in the United States, whether they're the formal or informal sectors, a big issue in developing countries. And then a topic which this paper doesn't discuss, but is another important margin for neutrality that Mahir has made um, important contributions in his research on, is having the same tax rate on a range of international decisions, where you locate yourself, how you organize um, your um, production relationships, where your headquarters are. And I addressed some of this the last time I spoke on this general topic um, and the paper on that was available outside. These issues are quite large in the United States. This gives you a sense of the tax rates on range from 10 to 27%, depending on whether you're looking at utilities or at wholesale and retail trade. Um, debt equity difference in the United States is 40 percentage points, the largest, as I'll show you in a moment, of any country. We tax our um, corporate businesses a little bit more heavily then we tax our pass-throughs. Um, our pass-throughs um, tend to be better lobbyists, and I think uh, my prediction, if we ever get tax reform, it's more likely to widen that disparity than narrow it, given um, the political context. 
we tax income very differently depending on what country you earn it in. Um, and then one that's quite important to underscore beyond the scope of this paper, um, but we tax business income much more heavily than housing, which actually we subsidize. So looking across countries, um, you see a lot of heterogeneity across countries in tax rates on the different forms of investment. Um, in the United States, we tax equipment more heavily than we tax structures, which means we underinvest in equipment and overinvest in structures, all things being considered. Um, there's a lot of other countries in the G20 that are on the exact opposite end of the scale, but in absolute value, that distortion is relatively large in the United States compared to the G20. Um, the distortion that's even larger in the United States compared to the G20, is, other G20 economies, is the difference between the tax rate on debt financed investment and equity financed investment. Um, I should say this is just showing you numbers at the corporate level. To evaluate this, you want to look at an integrated basis on the individual level, and that shrinks the gap some because at the individual level, you pay more taxes on um, interest than you do on dividends, at least in the United States. Um, but that disparity is quite large. And both of these, I'm talking about ways to improve the tax system by shrinking these towards zero. That, is, as I said, is invariant to where the overall um, rate is, but it's not entirely unrelated to where the overall rate is. So this chart shows you um, the statutory corporate rate on the x-axis, the effective corporate rate on the y-axis. Um, one thing to notice is everything is in the lower right, so everyone's effective rates are lower than their statutory rate. The line that connects those would be flatter than a 45 degree line, so the higher your statutory rate, on average, the larger the discrepancy between that and your effective rate, and that's certainly something you see for the United States um, in red. But what becomes important, um, and the reason why rate reduction can matter outside of cost of capital, is a lot of these other non-neutralities are easier to solve and less consequential um, at lower rates. That's less true for the disparity of tax rates between equipment and building investment, which you see here on the y-axis, is largely unrelated to what your tax rate is. Um, but it's very strongly true for the debt bias. The higher your statutory tax rate, the higher your debt bias is. Now, in theory, you could eliminate that debt bias, for example, by shifting to expensing and no longer allowing the deductibility um, of interest. So you could do that without bringing the rate down, but just about any system that broadens the tax base and lowers the tax rate is going to reduce that disparity between debt financed investment um, and equity financed investment and have the economic benefits, some of um, a subset of which are documented in this paper. So I'd say in conclusion, um, Looking as a general macro rule, looking at firms and trying to aggregate them up, I think is something that is a very fruitful and productive activity for trying to learn the sources of productivity, for trying to learn the sources of inequality. And it opens up new avenues for thinking about policy where you're thinking not just in crude aggregate terms about quantities of capital, but you're thinking of quality of capital. Some of that leads you in the same direction that one would have thought about um, before in terms of tax reform. Lower rates can help make the tax system more neutral, um, but they don't guarantee, but they're neither necessary nor sufficient for making the tax system more neutral. And the first thing policymakers should be looking at is these types of wedges and disparities, shrinking them to zero using the tax rate as a goal to help achieve that, uh, as a means to help achieve that goal, but not an end unto itself. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks to Adam for the uh, invitation and to uh, Vitor and, and Laura for the paper. Uh, I guess I'll put myself in the fool me once category.
this is my first time. Uh, I should have talked to Jason beforehand, I guess. Um, it's a really uh, interesting paper, and like Jason, I have the same uh, reaction, which is uh, for too long in public economics, we've been focused on this idea of efficiency just in quantities, and actually firm level productivity we know varies so much, and in fact, that is what we should be caring about. So this paper gets that point, I think, exactly right. So um, let me just try to take you through a couple of ideas about this. Um, and these are really questions on the margin more than anything else, but I think they're useful for thinking about the paper. I'm just going to quickly review the results, um, talk a little bit about moments, and then talk about these three uh, versions of this. I have a little bit more to say about multinationals and then the policy prescriptions that come out of the paper. So like Vitor, I love this picture too. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And the, you know, the short version is that the dispersion of firm productivity is, is much larger in these less efficient countries. The paper is a little ambiguous about what countries fall into which camps. It would be nice to see some lists of the countries you're talking about in different settings. But um, I can understand why that might be. But it would always be useful to see a little bit more granularity on what countries we're talking about. So um, that's the first piece of this. And then, of course, the second piece is this thought experiment. And I think the thought experiment is really important. Um, and I'm, I'm actually a little unclear about the thought experiment. And so let's just try to envision what it might be. So uh, just go to that uh, picture on the right-hand side. And as you can tell, the blue line is uh, somewhat flatter and to the left of uh, the red line or the red curve. So the question is, what is the thought experiment in terms of the potential productivity gain? I think in the original Xi Klanau papers, it was about moving the distribution towards a regular distribution. For example, like the United States, moving China and India towards uh, the United States kind of distribution. One could do that exercise, and one could, for example, try to move that blue country towards what the red country looks like. There's another exercise, which one could try to move the firms that are below the median to the median. I think that's one exercise that's engaged in. And then there's a third exercise, which is you could move all the firms to the top of their firms in that country, which I think is what is actually happening in the paper. So I think, well, it's some version of kind of moving people to the best or the 90th percentile or some version of a very good outcome. And so if that's the case, I guess, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong about that, because the paper does it a bunch of different ways, right? So it does it to the median, it does it to the 90th percentile, and it does it to the top performer. And so, you know, in my mind, the thought experiment has a nice analogy in sports, which is, you know, if you're a fan of Major League Baseball or Premier League or whatever, you know, imagine that high, high productivity player, and then imagine shifting people towards that high, high productivity player and think about what that sport would look like in that context. So that kind of blows my mind when I think about shifting a lot of people to the highest productivity players in some of these sports. It kind of blows my mind as to what might actually happen. So then we actually come to what the effects are. And so the effects are, as was suggested, 0.7 in annual growth rates for the advanced, 1.3 for emerging, and 0.9. And then we have the story that came out. I'm leaving out the formality piece of it, but uh, that's roughly what comes out of this. I do want to say that my other favorite picture is that picture on the right, which is just stunning, which is about um, the growth of small uh, firms in countries that have a special tax rate. That is an incredible picture and really gives lie to the logic and rhetoric we hear about small businesses all the time, which is a pet peeve of mine, um, which is we just hear about small businesses all the time. And that can be good, but preferential regimes put in place to help them have this small business trap effect, which I think is really Actually, in many ways, for me, the most important thing and interesting thing that comes out of the paper. I think it's really very, very important. Um, so, you know, I confess to being a little bit, uh, contrary to Vitor, a little underwhelmed by the numbers. Um, they are large, but it really depends on what the thought experiment is. Um, and maybe I got how we're shifting the distribution wrong, but if we're shifting people to that 90th percentile, which is what I understood to be happening, it's almost, it's almost a little perhaps disappointing, <laughs> you know, not to see larger effects. And so it depends on how you think about that thought experiment. I viewed it as a very aggressive thought experiment, uh, you know, which is to say we're really changing a lot of firms and we're pushing them towards the frontier. And then I almost in some ways expected more. I think there's an interesting puzzle about why the low-income folks, the low-income countries don't have as much as a kick as the emerging market countries. And it would be nice to hear something about that. I didn't see as much in the papers I'd like to. And then the final piece is, you know, is you know, I think Jason laid this out and Vitor laid this out. You can think about this at an aggregate level, you can think about this at a cross-sector level, and you can think about this at a cross-firm level. This paper is largely about the cross-firm level, and as I understand it, the previous paper was kind of at the aggregate level. I think a lot of what we may be talking about is at the cross-sectoral level, 
And so it's important to just think about whether that's a missing piece of the puzzle here. Uh, and that comes particularly true when we talk about some of the particular effects that they're talking about. So, you know, the first thing to say is um, on, uh, on these three pieces, which is the cross-asset, so now this is, you know, cross-asset distortions, cross-financing distortions, and then the size one effects. So the, here's the, a little bit of the tricky part about this, which is when we do this exercise within these tightly narrow industries, which is absolutely the right way to think about doing it, and obviously it's done very, very well, the question is, then I have to think about why and how uh, technological production functions are different across firms inside these tightly narrow industries. And so the first approximation, I think the point of narrowing the industry is to actually homogenize the production function. And so then I'm left not understanding quite as much about how machines and buildings and that distortion plays out within these narrowly uh, defined industries if in fact the technology production function is roughly the same inside that narrow industry. And that's another way of saying uh, maybe we'd expect to see that more across sectors uh, where I think it might play a little bit more you know, largely. Um, and the similar thing for debt equity, if you think about capital structure, um, then you know, a lot of predictions about capital structure are actually um, at the industry level, they should be similar within industries. So the homogenation of that, I'm not sure exactly how this works. What I, what I love is the size and the formality effects, which I think are so teed up for the setting that they're in. You know, within industry, looking at size and formality is just right, and the way they nail that is great. And I think that's the headline uh, for the paper, uh, and it's a very, very important headline. Um, final thing just to say about this is about multinationals. I think I would love to see a little bit more about multinational firms. That's my own bias, but I think that also may be because of what the paper is about, um, which is if we think about heterogeneity and productivity, we know uh, if you take some classical models that low productivity firms are domestic, higher productivity firms are exporters, the highest productivity firms are multinational firms. That's a hierarchy that comes out of uh, a lot of different trade models then it would be nice to focus on them a little bit more. Um, and so, and in particular in the data, I think that's important. That's just a little niggling point, which is some of the really high productivity players might actually be multinational affiliates. And that would be good to know because then we'd think about them a little bit different. And by the way, they might be high productivity for good and bad reasons, either because they're making themselves look like massive profit centers or because they are high productivity players. So I would just have loved to see a little bit more, uh, you know, about that. And then, I think the paper does something nice, which is it, it kind of gives you the traditional logic about why we're super concerned about the transfer pricing activities of multinational firms. Um, but then it turns it on its head a little bit, which I think is correct, you know, which is we should be careful about thinking about these firms that are very high productivity players and very mobile and assuming that we want to restrict those kinds of activities. And so I think the paper gets that just right as well. And so finally, uh, in terms of policy levers, uh, I think uh, they go where uh, one would have wanted them to go, which is the allowance for corporate equity and these cash flow taxes. I think that's right. I think it's largely on the asset and financing distortion piece, right? So it's about the cross-asset, getting that right. It's about the cross-financing and getting that right. I'm, a, I'm less uh, enamored of those. I'm more interested in the size and the formality because I think that's really what you're capturing very, very nicely here. I also think uh, one of the things we struggle with in public economics is we've had these uh, ACEs and cash flow taxes around for a long time, and we've propounded them. It is worthwhile just realizing that, you know, we, as we are in the current U.S. debate, contrasting an idealized version of a cash flow tax with our current income tax, and the notion that by the time that idealized cash flow tax goes through the legislative process, it's going to look anything like an idealized version is kind of fanciful. So it kind of tilts the bias towards an idealized example as opposed to what might actually obtain in reality. Um, and, uh, so, and that's why I think in many ways um, the size distortions actually could play in these, these systems, right? We often see uh, in ACE proposals or cash flow proposals, well, small firms get opted out. And I think we want to be a little bit careful about that. Final thing is the recommendation on small to new, uh, I think is, is interesting. So they kind of basically say, let's stop with the small, but let's go to the new. And I think I would have preferred to say, let's not try. You know, let's, let's be clear about the fact that that's a highly complicated exercise, and small has its problems, as we've just seen, and new might have its own problems. You could see churning of firms. You could see a lot of different things. So I think the lesson there is, is more about not doing the targeting than about changing the nature of the, the targeting. Um, I think it could have been interesting to talk a little more about broader movements away from corporate income taxation. You know, my story that I take away from this paper, because about, it's about size and formality for me, is just administration, 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 which is this is about tax authorities, and this is about the way they do their job and doing it well and uh, making them not corrupt. And so, and of course, that's what the fund does 
really well and works around the world on, I think that is a really, really important piece of this. And then the final thing I'll say, which is, you know, uh, along with some of these other comments, unfair, which is when we think about dispersion of productivity at the firm level, we have to think about managers. And there's now a rich literature about managers and the way they contribute to productivity. And in fact, uh, some of the productivity things we see in the United States are associated with managerial effects, or so that some of this work claims. If we believe that, then we have to really think about the individual income tax. You know, we have to really think about managerial incentives and make sure that we understand that broader picture. Now, I think that's beyond the gambit of your report, so it's an unfair comment, but I think when we think about this, we shouldn't uh, isolate the entity level or corporate level for thinking about this problem. We should be more expansive if we believe managerial incentives and managerial quality actually dictates some of this dispersion. So that's another way of saying I'd love even more out of this paper, uh, since I can't quarrel as much as I can with uh, the substance of it. So thank you. I really enjoyed the paper. Well, thank you very much, Mahir and Jason. I guess it's my fault not for uh, not making them read the paper ahead but for not finding someone to say all the obvious, horrible, horrendous faults with the paper. Uh, I assume there'll be someone in the audience who can take care of that for us. May I invite our two speakers and our two discussants to come up? I thought we were having a seat for Laura. I'm sorry. Uh, you should, there, there should be one more. Anyway, we'll, we'll I apologize. We will, we will deal with it. Um, the, I'm going to open this up. You'll get your commemorative nameplate in, in a moment. Um, I, I'm going to open this up for discussion in a moment, but I want to pick up on something that ran through, I think, all the presentations. So there is this fascinating fact and great set of chart that Jason put up, and, and Vitor muttered this is one of his favorite bits, is the discussion of um, different tax treatment, of equity, tax treatment of equity and debt. And certainly as a macro financial stability kind of person, I'm, I'm very cognizant of that. And I had discussions with people over the last few years about trying to change the overemphasis on debt in the US and UK and other places solely on that basis, without even thinking about tax efficiency. But I, I'd like to ask our panelists to, to go a little bit further on this in, in two ways. First is, um, the, do we have enough variation in the data set? There seemed to be a lot in the chart that I guess it was Jason showed. There seemed to be a, a wide range of debt versus equity uh, tax treatments. But the actual dispersion of growth rates, the unexplained dispersion of growth rates in the OECD or in a large sample isn't that large. Right? By the time we put in uh, savings, inflation, demographics, basic growth stuff. So it's a long-winded way of saying you guys all seem to think this is really big, but it's nice to see at the micro level, but why don't we see it at the macro level? Or am I misreading the evidence? And there is clear evidence at the macro level that it matters. The second question is, one of the things that's been amazing about the recent tax discussions in the US on the, is that the Ryan Brady proposal included, and Jason has picked up on this in some of his recent writings, and I know Vitor is well aware of this, has included essentially getting rid of the interest deduction. And when we were talking about this during the financial crisis as unthinking ta tax, uh, macro people rather than tax people, we all thought that was, you know, even if we wanted to do that, we could never do that because there are so many pe small businesses and people who are so into this. Yet in the US right now, it, it barely seems to get commented on. So is this, and especially Vitor, maybe you know this from other places, is this easy? Have we been missing a trick? Is it just, you know, we can all just wish and the, uh, the, the, debt, the debt preference will go away tomorrow with no political resistance? Why is this so under-discussed? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Would you allow me uh, three quick reactions of before course. I go to your two I, questions? I ask you for three quick reactions. <laughs> so uh, my, my three quick reactions would be the uh, following. 
One of the reasons I'm uh, uh, so excited about this line of research is because it shows, as the two discussants uh, emphasized, that micro matters. Going to a very detailed level of information using, say, firms' individual data, using establishment uh, individual data, allow us to learn about effects that we would not properly capture without microdata. And going forward, I do believe that we at the IMF and researchers elsewhere will be uh, using uh, this uh, uh, micro, very large micro data sets quite systematically, and that's uh, likely to become uh, a very uh, interesting industry. So we will see a lot coming out of, uh, of that. So we wanted to emphasize very much the uh, impacts on allocation, and that's why uh, and I'm going to make a slight detour to tackle your first question on the uh, uh, debt uh, bias. That's why we focused on innovation rather than on something else. It is precisely in the area of uh, innovation because young innovative firms have to use equity to finance their activities, right, giving... Uh, information asymmetry problems, that the debt bias has more severe um, uh, allocational consequences. Now, we have been working on the debt equity bias uh, quite a lot in the uh, Fiscal Affairs Department, and uh, Mick Keen and Ruth Demoy have uh, looked at the debt bias for uh, non-financial corporations and financial institutions and they have uh, put together uh, synthetic uh, control methods that allow uh, one to look at the effects for countries that have adopted, for example, allowance for corporate equity. And the example that normally they present is Belgium. And you do see that introducing allowance for corporate uh, equity leads to a substantial uh, reduction of, uh, in debt levels. And they argue that that is uh, important not only for neutrality reasons like Jason uh, was emphasizing, but also for financial stability reasons because more leveraged firms are more vulnerable, more likely to go uh, bankrupt. And of course, when you have very high debt levels, you have uh, uh, heightened uh, risks to financial stability. So that's uh, so th this is kind of like my uh, my my first remark, the first thing that I'm uh, uh, passionate about. The uh, uh, second uh, point uh, that I want to emphasize was something that me here. Uh, uh, emphasized as well, but I feel so strongly about this that I want to uh, uh, repeat it. The way we look at taxation in, uh, in the Fiscal Affairs Department of the Fund is we look at taxation very much uh, following uh, Joel Slambrod and co-authors. We look at the tax system. And a tax system takes tax policy and revenue administration together. One cannot really figure out the impact from f tax policy without knowing how that is actually implemented. And so taking tax policy and revenue administration together makes a tremendous amount of difference, and we have uh, uh, exciting uh, results, which are quite surprising for most policymakers, that revenue administration has macroeconomic consequences. Revenue administration, we show in this chapter, has implications for the efficiency in the allocation of resources. So for economists, using time to look at revenue administration actually uh, pays out. And if you would ask us about our uh, results on uh, tax compliance, we will be most happy uh, to answer uh, those. Now, on the, uh, uh, your question about whether it is, uh, um, it is uh, easy 
uh, to get rid of uh, interest deductions. If you go around the world, you see that many countries, more than 50 countries, have, uh, 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 have limits on the ability uh, of firms uh, to uh, uh, deduct uh, interest payments, so they have, uh, they have done that. You don't have examples in which that has been put in place in a neutral way, which answers your question about politics. So clearly, these things are highly political. It's very, very hard to do it in a uh, neutral way. In uh, the cases that we have looked at, the experience is much more limited. So about uh, a do sorry, a half dozen countries have allowance for corporate equity. And uh, in those countries, the treatment is much more, is much closer to neutral in, in the sense that Jason uh, pointed out. So it does seem that an, an allowance for corporate equity is uh, uh, easier as a uh, uh, political uh, object in terms of delivering a uh, tax reform which is closer to neutrality. On limits on um, uh, debt deduction, uh, we're not as close uh, to uh, neutrality as we would like. I, I'm interested, obviously, in me here, Jason, Laura's Laura's comments, but just let me push you on one thing, Vitor. Mm -hmm. You said there are roughly 50 countries that do put limits on interest deductibility as that you're aware of. Can you say anything about how binding are those limits or what are the common attributes of those countries or is it just a random set? So it, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not a random set. Uh, Rude and Meek put out about uh, some months ago, I think it was in November, a blog in which yes, they I have... I didn't read it, so what, what did it say? They, they have all of that. What they emphasize is that there is a lot of heterogeneity. Okay. So you don't seem to have any simple way of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, characterizing patterns. Uh, at least they did not report on it, and I'm pretty sure that they look for them. Thank you. Mihir? I was just going to mention on the debt equity uh, question, I, I think I'm less enamored of that as a problem than I think many people are. And I, I think the reason for that is, you know, in the finance literature, it has been hard to find tax effects on capital structure. Right. And that's because there are a lot of other things going on. And so uh, I don't know if it's quite as big a deal as we think it might be. And of course, even the macro effects may not be quite as big a deal as we think. I mean, the dominant fact about U.S. corporations for the last two decades is how underlevered they've been how much cash they hold, and how under-levered they've been up until really, you know, just the last year. So, I, I, yeah, and there are big incentives to use debt. So I think um, that may not be quite as big a deal as we think. Obviously, the systematic problems you're pointing to, Adam, have a lot to do with how financial institutions use leverage and how households use leverage, but I think the corporate sector being over-levered is not something that resonates with me, and I don't know if it, you know, is coincident with the facts. And the second point is on why somehow the DBCFT has managed to not provoke as much ire as others. The one, maybe two answers to that. One is uh, because it's been coupled with expensing, and uh, people are quite excited about that. <laughs> the people who might have, um, you know, have been the worst off are really quite happy about expensing, and that's a trade that they may actually like. And then the second point is that, you know, the people who really will get hit is the private equity industry in the United States is the ones who will potentially get quite hit. And I think there's enough in the rest of the plan that gives them, makes them feel okay. Yep. Uh, you know, um, so I think that, that I think helps them. The way they think about losses, for example, I think that gives them enough. Thank you. Jason? I, on your first sort of meta question, I think it's almost always the case that bottom-up studies add up to more than top-down studies find. You see that in the energy efficiency literature and climate change. Um, when we asked um, the Recovery Act, all the different agencies in the government to estimate the total number of jobs created by all their different little programs, I think the number was like 300 million. <laughs> um, and, um, and you see that here. Um, now, it's possible that everyone's making offsetting errors, so that would rec reconcile the macro um, with the micro. You know, in this case, it was about a quarter point was the growth effect of all of this. I find it plausible that the difference between a really good business tax system that gets this perfectly right um, and one that's not is a quarter point. So I didn't think that was overly stretching it, but, but I agree that 
that's a general point. I mean, this gets to one of Mahir's analytic criticisms. I did think that more of the um, mileage is between sectors, not within sectors. The paper is not equipped to study things between sectors um, because of the way the empirical model is set up. Um, the fact is, though, that it empirically does detect these differences across firms that have different within the same industry that have different ratios of equipment to structures or that have different debt equity structures for whatever reason. And so sometimes it didn't assume um, this result. It, it found this result. I found in some ways it puzzling because it found it not in the place I thought it was likely to be. I took that to mean it was a little bit more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the interest deduction, I think I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, one thing that the Ryan Brady plan did brilliantly was include border adjustment. And we've all spent so much time talking about border adjustment, we didn't even notice this other huge thing exactly. in it. There are ways to get halfway to the huge thing. Um, in Germany, it's like a, I think you're only allowed to deduct 30, interest up to 30% of your profits or something to that effect and there's different ways to do haircuts thin cap rules of which we sort of have very unbinding ones here i think ultimately though you have a lot of conservatives excited about interest expensing i mean expensing and ending interest deductibility because they think it's a consumption tax and when democrats realize what Mihir said that it's actually closes the private equity loophole maybe it'll get done thanks um i i don't want to make this ping pong, but I just do have to point out as someone who had a sort of mid-level, neither micro nor macro, studied Germany versus U.S. I mean, I find a lot of resonance in what Mihir said. So Germany has had those debt limits, and it's very visible in different behavior in, say, household real estate market or household debt. But in corporate structure, German firms are always vastly more leveraged. Than, than American firms. I mean, the, 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 the debt finance, the preponderance of debt finance there is huge. And, and similarly, despite having a better equity issue, the Germans always raise the issue of, we don't have a, a equi Aktien Kultur, uh, an equity investment culture. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't want to keep the bait here, but it's, it's not just the sleight of hand that micro doesn't add up to macro. There is something else, as Mahir said, about corporate structure here. Uh, can can yeah. the, uh, there was something that I completely forgot to clarify. So in terms of the benchmark for the estimate of the one percentage point, uh, what we do is uh, we assume that the country that we are considering would have a distribution identical to the country that yeah. is in the 90th uh, percentile. So since we don't do that with the firm that is at the 19th percentile, but distribution of the country, uh, I think that we're uh, less vulnerable to the concern that you had that we were, in a sense, uh, being too optimistic about what could uh, be achieved. And we are comparing distributions with distributions. And from that viewpoint, we're not disturbing the game uh, that much. So uh, my intuition uh, was that the uh, effect was uh, large for the experiment that we were conducting, and I still uh, believe that that is the case. The other thing that I believe- Can I just ask a question on that, Vitor? Because this was very helpful, because I, I don't think I quite understood that. So you're taking the, the, the most precise distribution, right, the country with the most precise distribution, and then what are you doing with the average? So I mean, does my, I'm, the, I'm a low efficiency country, Jason's the high one. So I assume, I take on his dispersion, and do I keep my average? Or do I take on his whole distribution? Or do I just take on this dispersion? So, uh, you want to yeah, I, was wa I was waiting for the switch to Laura. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so actually it, it was, it's taking on the dispersion. Not, so not the, what we're suggesting is that the more efficient firms in the country would become larger. And the less efficient firms would, you know, because they're less efficient, have to drop out. I have to drop out, okay. So it doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden making the less efficient firms more productive. I mean, there are many reasons why they're less productive. Uh, but you, you take manager. them out and then you make the big ones so, bigger. So that's, so you're actually shifting the resources from those that are less productive to those that are more. So, so it's a, so you, so we're not making, um, 
we're not making an emerging market an advanced economy because there are other reasons why sure. that they have that their distrib their productivity. But we're just saying that the resources that do have they should be assigned to the okay. more productive. Great. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. No, th this is great. So thank you. Let me open it up now to uh, question. No, let me open it up now to questions. I, I no no. Let me open it up now to questions. <laughs> Um, so uh, there's a microphone at back and there's a traveling mic in front. Um, I guess since none of our guests are speaking, we'll go to an internal question. Nicolas Veron here at the Institute. Uh, thanks for the very uh, thought-provoking presentations. And my question is on this, uh, I think, very compelling view of the small business trap that you gave us as part of the uh, paper. And um, Starting from uh, Mihir's comments, I have a question to the, the paper authors and a question to Jason. The question to Jason is, how do you view this question of the small, uh, this issue of the small business trap from a US perspective? Because in the US, we often hear that the SMEs are paying more tax uh, because they are less good at exploiting loopholes uh, than large business. So, uh, so what would be the US view on this? And, um, and to those authors, just how do you react uh, to the Mihir's skepticism against shifting from small to new. Uh, we all know the political uh, drivers of the preferences for small businesses, but what, how, how would you take his critique in, in, uh, in, into account to sort of uh, do a sexy or compelling policy prescription, a bit like the IMF has done for you know, ending fuel subsidies and things like that? Um, so should I go first? So, so in general, small businesses pay lower taxes in the United States than larger businesses with a lot of heterogeneity in both. Um, that's one, because small businesses are more likely to be pass-throughs, so they'll only pay one level of tax rather than large businesses, which tend to be C-corps, which are paying two levels of taxes. There's certain things in the tax code which are preferential, so small businesses get to expense all of their business investment already, and they get to deduct their interest on it. Um, the large businesses don't get to um, do that. And um, and then just um, what the paper very politely calls informality, which could also <laughs> be called tax cheating, um, is far more extensive in is massively um, concentrated in the small business sector. Um, although of course, there's many wonderful tax-paying small businesses, and, and I love them too. Um, and and patrons. You're no longer them. in government. Yeah, you, you don't, don't have to say that. that. I don't even say that. None of them. No. Uh, so so in general, um, so I had never seen empirical evidence on the small business trap in the United States, um, but that resonated with me as a problem in our tax system. So on the small uh, versus uh, new and innovative uh, companies, um, we looked at the issue in detail uh, one year ago when we were looking and identifying these externalities that having to do with innovation, which are important at the sectoral level, at the national level, and at the global level. So it's uh, uh, our conclusion one year ago was that it was worthwhile to subsidize these activities, and we went into issues of design, right? In, in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to target firms that actually uh, innovate. Uh, the evidence that we collected shows that the way it is done uh, is quite challenging in terms of the administrative capacity that it requires, uh, but we uh, did show that it can be done uh, properly. So it's not, it's a, it's a very good design question, but some countries have been able to tackle that quite effectively. Laura, do you want to add something? I'd like to add something. So, um, so we do recognize that small businesses will tend to face higher tax compliance costs. So even though their tax rates might be lower, it's uh, more costly for them to submit their tax payments every month or every, every, every quarter. Um, and so that's why part of our, our report, we're saying that governments should really try to reduce those compliance costs because they will very quickly reduce the cost on small and young firms and they'll be able to grow and, and, and be more productive. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience? Yes, please. 
thanks very much to the panel. I'm not an expert on taxes. I hope this is relevant. But I'm sorry, your name and affiliation, oh, sorry. please. Sherry Stevenson with the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland. It's a think tank. Um, I heard a program recently uh, in the U.S. discussing how the U.S. has become effectively de facto a tax haven for a lot of basically unidentified money and even money laundering and how it's possible to open a company in Delaware with absolutely no information, not even an ID, uh, just a name, and even that becomes a number, and uh, that um, this has basically de facto attracted a lot of illicit capital and so forth. And I was just wondering how this might impact your productivity numbers. I know you looked at it in terms of informal versus formal, but part of the informality would seem to me to be this kind of underground um, or illicit economy that is clearly not covered by the tax code as well. And this might have a bigger impact in countries, which apparently now seems to be the United States, that are easier to, um, uh, where it's easier to basically place these um, unidentified funds. Thanks. Can I just sort of ask for a slightly expanded answer, building on Dr. Stevenson's question. I mean, Mahir mentioned multinational corporations. We just talked about small businesses. How much is tax competition and tax havens affecting the kind of results that you're thinking about? What do you think of the size of that issue? Obviously, we'd love to fix both problems. But sort of picking up on Dr. Stevenson, you know, how, how much should we be, if there's a limited amount of political capital, how much should we be worrying about BEPs versus worrying about domestic tax reform on, on simplification. I mean, how do we prioritize these things? So if I may go first, the, the, the Fiscal Monitor Chapter 2 looks at the general outline of uh, your question, and it shows, and that's something that I believe is very important, that the way uh, taxes are enforced matters a lot for the allocation of resources. So typically when we think about tax evasion, the first thing that comes to mind is th that tax evasion undermines the ability of the state to collect revenue. What the fiscal monitor shows is that the fact that you have some firms that do not pay taxes or do not pay all taxes they should, while some other firms are fully compliant, creates a misallocation of resources which is uh, quite significant and uh, does show in uh, macroeconomic statistics. I think that, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, we are the first uh, to emphasize that macroeconomic side of it. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, a important thing. On your question about uh, domestic uh, versus uh, international, the chapter two of the fiscal monitor uh, is mostly about national uh, tax systems. Of course, everything that has to do with corporate tax has a potential uh, uh, international ramifications. We have uh, put out in uh, 2014 an international tax spillovers uh, report where we look at uh, these uh, uh, types of things and uh, international uh, cooperation in the area of tax is one of the areas where uh, global uh, cooperation is uh, most important. But from the viewpoint of the activities of the Fiscal Affairs Department, uh, most of our activity in tax is about domestic national tax systems. Thank you very much, Vitor. I was just going to, on, on this question, I think it's a really interesting question. So w this idea that the U.S. is a tax haven has two pieces to it. At least. Uh, one is, uh, at the corporate level, it is the case that a lot of foreign multinationals uh, don't report any profits in the U.S., and that's for a variety of reasons that they're able to do that. Uh, at the individual level, what you're hinting at, I think, is more on the individual level or some notion of pools of capital, nefarious pools of capital out there. I think that's probably less clear. The real problem in the US is that we allow for so much anonymity with the creation of those entities. Um, but, a, but a lot of those flows are taxed at the portfolio level as opposed to the entity level. If you're looking for a tax haven that people don't talk about, you, you might look at the UK. Um, 
because of the non-DOM rules, there is a lot of activity in the UK that might be associated with that. Um, and then finally on tanks competition generally, and this you know, relates to the DBECFT, you know, one of the puzzling facts, despite all the high end ringing, is that corporate tax revenues have been relatively robust. So we're acting as if they're falling and they're gonna plummet and they're going away. That may happen, but it's not showing up yet. Um, and so that is one of the curious things about this, which is we do a lot of hang wringing about this problem and yet um, corporate tax revenues are, are not falling off a cliff. Now it is true that corporate profitability has been massive um, and so maybe you'd want to have more corporate tax revenue than you've had. Uh, but the idea that it's disappearing, I think, is not exactly um, consistent with what's going on today. It's not disappearing, but if you look at the share of income for C-Corps versus pass-throughs, I think it's gone from about 75% in 1980 to about 40 or yep. something percent now. Um, so you do see a large part of why it's not disappearing is you sort of have this self-help where everyone's moved over. Um, into a different system that doesn't have some of the same issues, at least. Great. All right, one last question, or please. Um, thank you. Uh, Angel Ubide with Goldman Sachs. Uh, two quick questions. First one, um, there seems to be better TFP or R&D activity where there is more equity issuance. Have you looked at the causality? Could it be the other way around? So where firms are more productive and more successful, they have an easier time issuing equity. And so are we looking at it sort of the wrong way? And this links to what Adam was saying about the equity culture in some countries, right? So some investors don't like the idea of losing money on their principal. So would you get to the point of recommending subsidizing equity ownership as a way of fostering this improvement in the uh, in the um, in the structure of capital of the corporate sector. Thank you. Uh, so we, we we always worry about issues of um, uh, causality, and one of the techniques that we have uh, been using systematically in um, last uh, months is this idea of the synthetic control method. So you try to look uh, for a country that has uh, introduced a uh, change in uh, policy that has not been followed by some other countries that are similar, and by looking at how they are different, we uh, believe that we have some evidence that the thing is causal. Of course, it's not fully conclusive, as you well know, but it's a way of trying to get around uh, these issues. When it comes to uh, innovation and the link between innovation and equity and whether we go as far as to uh, uh, argue for uh, subsidizing equity, w we don't. So if we look at tax rules uh, uh, around the world, the discrimination against equity is so large that eliminating it uh, seems to be a large enough experiment uh, for one to look at. And we do have that experiment in countries that have adopted this uh, allowance for corporate equity. And it does look like, in terms of reducing levels of debt and increasing levels of equity, uh, the, the effects seem to be uh, large. And we have those estimates. What we do argue should be subsidized uh, is uh, innovation, because we believe we have been able to estimate quite sizable external effects, and that does justify a uh, subsidy that could have uh, uh, important effects on allocation of resources and growth. Is anyone else, me here, or Jason, or Laura, want to comment? Okay. Well, thank you all very much for engaging. This is obviously an in-depth dive, and I give great credit to Laura, Vitor, and their colleagues in the Fiscal Affairs Department at the Fund for continuing to advance really relevant, important research. And thanks as well to me here and Jason for reading the paper. Um, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks.